Right now, you can pick up any device and contact anyone you know or love just about anywhere in the world. You might send them a message, contact them via video or drop into their inbox. So why is it that so many of us feel so lonely? One in four of us, in fact, and that was before this pandemic and imposed isolation hit. Some of us are cut off in ways we never imagined. So tonight, we're talking about loneliness, the causes, the costs and the remedies. You've got loads of questions on this, so let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Hi there, welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, a man who is not afraid to talk about how he feels or ask you repeatedly how you feel, long-time radio host and mental health campaigner, Gus Warland. Also, clinical psychologist Michelle Lim, who chairs an organisation called Ending Loneliness Together, and is calling for a national response to address loneliness. Rosemary Kays is a leading human rights lawyer. She is the vice chair of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And to top it all off, she was also awarded last year's Human Rights Medal. Psychologist, social researcher and author Hugh McKay, who believes it's up to us as individuals to combat this. And author and activist Sarah Wilson, who's written candidly about her struggles with loneliness and anxiety. Please make all of them feel welcome. <laughs> Remember, you can join the conversation on iView, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Quanda is the hashtag. Each week, our panellists engage in a robust and respectful debate. So if you are getting involved on social media, we ask that you are also respectful. Our first question tonight comes from Jane Hasley in the studio audience. Thanks very much, Hamish. Research has found that the impact of loneliness on our physical health is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day and can increase the risk of death by 26%. Our harsh COVID-19 restrictions are increasing loneliness across all ages. What changes and support need to be made to address this harm, particularly for our fellow Australians in Victoria? Uh, Michelle, I want to start with you. Can you just define what loneliness is for us? So loneliness is defined as subjective social isolation. Um, so it's a subjective feeling where your social relationships are not meeting your social needs. So in this case, um, it's different uh, from social isolation. So social isolation more crudely is defined by objective indicators. So if you're living alone or you know fewer people, that's being social socially isolated. So Sarah, it's not about being alone necessarily, but what does loneliness feel like? Oh, gosh. Uh, look, I, I really like to distinguish between aloneness and loneliness. I am somebody who has lived alone for a long time. And um, as you mentioned, I think the pandemic actually created aloneness into an issue um, because we were shut off from the biological mechanisms required to deal with a crisis. So during that time when I experienced loneliness, it felt like an ache. It felt like an ache for something that was almost indistinguishable and undescribable. It also felt like a deep itch. And I describe it as an itch because it was also a sense that there was a missingness. There was something missing that wasn't just people, but a disconnection from meaning. And I think that that's the harshest part of loneliness if we drill it down to what it really is, which I feel is a disconnection from meaning, it, 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 a can, meaningful relationships. Can it be physical pain? Absolutely. It plays out very much like anxiety and depression does. So at a biological level, what happens when we experience loneliness, it's very much like when we're hungry, we go in search of food. When we're thirsty, we go in search of water. When we're in a crisis, we go in search of other humans. And we need that to actually downplay or regulate our nervous system so that we can process a lot of what's going on in a crisis. When we're denied that, when we're isolated, as Michelle says, we are actually denied that physical outlet. And so it builds up much like anxiety does. It feels like shortness of breath, breath heart palpitations, um, and a real sense that we are in a flight or fight mode. Yet we have no release for it. We have no ability to go and satiate that urge. So it compounds. So, Rosemary, during this pandemic, during the initial lockdown, how did loneliness take shape in your life? Um, in my life, I suppose, 
it was more a disconnect from my family because it was more the disconnect from the outside world and for, for lots of people with disability during this time, there was actually greater connection mm. because so much of the rest of the community all of a sudden could go online and so you could participate in things from your own home. Now, people with disabilities struggle to be able to access the, the wider community for a variety of ex access issues. And so, in a perverse sort of way, the beginnings of the lockdown and COVID has actually opened up avenues where people with disability can actually participate a little bit more. I suppose for me personally, as I say, it's about my family and my very close relationships that you weren't there for, the physical bond that you can have with people. I mean, being a person with a disability and especially a person who uses a wheelchair, I have structural barriers around me and there's lots of structural barriers within our community that separates me from engaging with people. But yeah, it was the cutoff from my family. But strangely enough, the connections more broadly with the outside world were opened up for myself and for lots of other people with disability. Gus, I think you felt some loneliness as, as a young guy, as a, as a teen. Yeah, no doubt about it. I de definitely felt myself at times feeling very lonely and not feeling as if I had the right connections and so forth around me. But it took a little bit of time and it took education. Eventually we got there and I certainly feel now uh, there's a bond that I have with certain friends and family which I've learnt and had to sort of work out over time. And I suppose for me through the pandemic, I had my daughter in Japan initially, so I wanted to get her back and eventually she decided to go to England because she thought it was all going to be over because she's 18 and she was positive. Um, and now she's back with us. To get everyone back in together again was brilliant, but then I worry about my mum who I couldn't go and visit and be with. So, yeah, it's been a real up and down last six or seven months and, of course, the work we're doing at Gotcha for Life around prevention of suicide, for me, I believe suicide is a death of loneliness. So that's where I've been so worried and concerned about those numbers. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take our next question tonight. It's a video from Amelia Pace in Glen Waverley, Victoria. As a millennial, I know how many of my peers feel a sense of loneliness. My generation often associates being alone with being lonely. My question for the panel is in a world in which we are ever more connected, why is it that so many of us feel so alone? Hugh. Yes, connected but lonely <laughs> has become a kind of popular phrase to describe this thing that we perhaps didn't anticipate, that the, 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 the information technology revolution that promised that we would be more connected than we've ever been in human history, and that's true, uh, didn't uh, also mention that it would be easier than ever in human history to stay away from each other. Uh, so I think we shouldn't be at all surprised that connected but lonely is a phenomenon. When you think about the species that we belong to, Hamish, I mean, we humans, like many other species on the planet, are essentially social beings. We're, so, we're herd animals. We absolutely need each other. We're hopeless in isolation. Uh, we congregate, we form families, neighbourhoods, workplaces, choirs, football teams, etc. That's the kind of people we are. Now, all of those kinds of connections that are typical of herd animals involve being in the same place at the same time. They involve face-to-face -face contact, eye contact, sometimes touch, uh, picking up all the nuances, all the subtleties of interpersonal conversation, rate of speech, tone of voice, posture, gesture, all of those things. Now, the information technology revolution, which of course has been a bit of a lifesaver for many people through the pandemic, uh, the kind of connection that it offers is of a completely different kind, which is not consistent with the sort of connection that members of a social species need. So In other words, when you, when you go online, there's no more eye contact, there's no more subtlety, all those complexities, all those nuances, there's no touch. Uh, and so it's a completely different experience. Yes, 
we're transferring, we're exchanging a lot of data with each other on social media and via emails and even visually on Zoom, but it's in a completely different category from what happens when we're actually face to face. Can I ask so, though, because we're sitting in a TV studio, you're in Canberra via a video link, you're yes. right next to Rosemary when I look towards you. Are you saying that I, I'm connecting with Rosemary and Sarah and Gus in a totally different way to what I'm able to with you simply because of the, the way in which you're, you're talking to us? Yeah, I'm afraid that's true, and I can feel the disadvantage from this, from this studio. Uh, but at least uh, we've got all this technology that we can at least see each other. You can see me waving my hands around, etc. Uh, many of the social media messages that are used as a substitute for face-to-face -face contact, of course, don't have this at all. Uh, and even in this setting, uh, it's not anything like... You can't reach out and give me a reassuring pat on the shoulder the way you could right, with I'm, not, I'm not allowed to do that with any of these people either <laughs> under, uh, under COVID restrictions. Sarah, you, you have talked, though, about the, the positive side of social media, mm. the sort of antidote to loneliness. Yeah. What, what can you get there that, that's harder for you in real life? Technology is always an, an enabler. It's not the criminal that we set it out to be. So um, it can actually be used in wonderfully positive ways. And for me, it... it much like Rosemary, um, I lived on my own during the, the pandemic and the shutdown here in New South Wales, um, and I've lived on my own for 12 years. And so it's been a way for me to connect. And I have been isolated to a certain extent with my mental health. So it has actually enabled me to connect in a very meaningful way. And I think that's the key issue here. And that's what distinguishes things in this conversation with, with Hugh and Michelle um, online, so to speak, is that we're actually having a meaningful discussion. What technology often enables is a lack of meaningful conversation because of the disengagement. So I've been able to use technology mostly because of my age. I um, straddled the era when Twitter didn't exist and it, and it came into to play when I was in my 30s and I was able to actually deal with it in a mature way. Same with Instagram, Facebook, etc. And I was an early adopter. Um, but I was actually able to engage it in a way where I wasn't as addicted, I knew a time before, and I was able to use it in meaningful ways. Um, so during the COVID era, <laughs> I've actually found technology to be wonderfully beneficial because I've found, much like Rosemary has, a lot of my family and friends have all suddenly had to interact the same way I have, and we've all done it in quite a meaningful way. We've been forced to. We've been forced to slow down. Um, so I don't think that technology is the devil. It's an enabler. Unfortunately, however, technology has, over the last 20 years, been all about getting rid of discomfort. The bigger issue that technology raises, it's made us very um, unresilient to discomfort, including being able to be on our own, including having to face difficult and therefore meaningful conversations with others. That's where I see the issue lies. So, so Gus, on the, on, the, on the... Please, feel free to applaud me. <laughs> Gus, on, on the slowing down, on the meaningful conversations, you've got three adult children, I think they're all at home, there's some partners in there as well. Mm. What do you do to sort of force the meaningful <laughs> conversation with them? Look, it, it is difficult at times, and I suppose you want to have the house a safe place for kids to be around. And as you said, I've got a son 20, a daughter nearly 19, a daughter 17. They've now all got partners, so it is full. And I love the fact that our place is full. But even in a big house with a lot of people, sometimes people can feel very, very lonely. So the most important thing for me and all the stuff we're doing at Gotcha is that people will have a conversation if you build a safe environment to have it. You can't force it. You've just got to allow it to happen properly. And if you feel safe enough to have a chat, you'll probably have it. And I think that's yes. something that's built over a period of time. You feel as if um, you're a safe place to have a chat, so I'm going to have a chat. But you also sort of talk about the value of an awkward silence. Like no doubt about it. Like, we are taught as, as blokes to fill that silence all the time. A smart-ass comment or a joke or whatever. To actually sit in some... I mean, some you did do commercial radio for quite some <laughs> time, well, guys. That, that is right. <laughs> it was 2,500 shows of that type of stuff. And, of course, dead air on radio is literally dead air. So for me to sit in some vulnerable silence and to teach blokes to have that conversation where you don't have to flow all the time and not everything is just moving and grooving, having that type of discussion where you might actually be having tears coming out of your eyes, snot coming out of your nose and you're just trying to get stuff out, that vulnerable conversation of gravity 
is the conversation we should be having more of and we never quite give ourselves a chance to do that. And blokes then, even if they're together, they're lonely because they're not talking about what truly means something to them. Uh, I can see Rosemary's trying to get in, trying to find some dead no, air, Gus. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's more the fact that you know, that's nearly, it's nearly the old six Yorkshire men. That's luxury. I mean, lots of people with disability don't have that space. They don't have that safe space. The people that they connect with are paid employees. They're staff members of services and their lives are built around the disability service system and that's all they know and that's the only space they have. And we're now having a Royal Commission that's examining the, the abuse and neglect and exploitation that happens in those closed, segregated environments. And so... Where can those people with disability find those safe spaces, find those connections? I mean, loneliness, if it's, if it's about the subjective quality of the relationships you have, if your only relationship is a, a paid service relationship, well, then that's not going to fulfil the intimate, the, the meaningful mm. corners of your your, your soul. Hamish, could I jump in at this point? Sure. Um, it, it seems to me that what Rosemary's just said and also what Sarah said about being alone at times when she was struggling with mental illness, uh, th this is our problem. Uh, it does seem to me that we talk about loneliness sometimes as though the people who are lonely uh, have this problem and maybe they should be doing something about it. Uh, when we talk about, as we now do talk about, an epidemic of loneliness, it's our epidemic. It's a result of ways in which our society has changed. We've become more socially fragmented uh, and we are less attentive to neighbours. Uh, an alarming number of people don't know their neighbours. I think some of Michelle's recent search, research showed that about 50% of Australians say they don't feel they could call on their neighbours in a crisis. Now, what... what what should we take out of this? It seems to me those of us who don't feel lonely uh, need to re-examine the role of neighbour. We need to understand that there's probably someone in our street who is struggling with a d disability or is a frail elderly person living alone or is a single parent uh, having trouble getting out and socialising or is a person struggling with some form of mental illness. That, that's our responsibility you, uh, I, to be better neighbours to those people. I, I want to take us to our next question because it, it will take us on from that point. It's from Malcolm Pryor in Ashwood, Victoria. Does the panel think that because, A, so much speech is now forbidden, i.e. offends certain minorities, contains trigger phrases, et cetera, et cetera, and, B, we're so quick to write off people we disagree with, Twitter anybody, We've become incapable of having real conversations about real issues, thereby contributing to our own loneliness. Michelle, some academics write about social media actually sort of dividing us, pushing us into corners and therefore actually making us feel more lonely because we're less likely to reach out and talk to someone that we might not agree with. Look, I think, um, I, I just think of the term homophily. So we tend to hang out with people that agree with our, our own opinions and we tend to relate and function in circles in which um, mm. other people are similar to us. So this is actually, um, with or without social media, involve and we tend but, but to... But social uh, media accentuate that? Because in normal life, you meet people from... All, all walks of life. You might sit next to them on the train, you might uh, have a child playing sport with them. So you have these conversations uh, w with people that you may not agree with just by being there, whereas social media tends to sort of put people into corners. Look, I think one of the things about social media is that it's easier to hide behind that screen. So it may come across as a little bit more aggressive or a little bit more disconnecting in some way. But I actually agree with Sarah. It's, it's not social media per se. It's about how you use it um, that's more important. And, you know, if you're using it to uh, be combative or you're using it to... 
you know, uh, create conflict, you know, or you're using it to compare yourself with other people. Those are unhelpful intentions of using social media. But if you're using it to actually reconnect with people that you care about, you know, your friends from the other side of the world, you know, those things can really um, reduce loneliness. So mm. for me, it's about how you use it as opposed to the technology itself. Mm. Mm. Uh, look, Michelle, I think that's a really great point. And I might just add to that to um, speak to Malcolm's question a little. Um, I think what a lot of this boils down to when we're talking about when aloneness or disconnection or social isolation becomes a problem, it's when that meaningfulness piece comes in. Um, and a lot of philosophers throughout history since you know, the, the Greek philosophers through to, I think, Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, but also psychologists today talk about the far more dangerous and disconcerting loneliness, which is moral aloneness or moral loneliness. And I think this is what we're actually straddling at the moment. And I think that is at the core of the real pain of the loneliness that we feel. We can deal with aloneness if we feel that we have meaningful connections on Zoom or with family in whatever form it might take. Um, we can deal with technology and the limitations it has if we are engaged in some kind of meaningfulness. Now, we are in a world with, where COVID revealed a lot of this for us, revealed a lot of the redundancies in our culture that the neoliberal system has set us up for. Um, but that we also had the bushfires. We also had the Black Lives Matters um, riots and, and protests. All of this has been happening at a time as democracy has gone dramatically downhill. We've got political fragmentation and to Malcolm's um, question, we've got people who can't talk straight. We don't get straight answers from politicians. And we are feeling dreadfully morally alone, where the general moral umpires that used to guide us in life, whether it was the church that ordained a Sabbath, whether it was the trade unions that ensured things were fair, whether it was leaders or even the media that kept everything a little bit honest, um, they've all fallen apart. And so we're expected to navigate this on our own. And that, I think, is at the core of a lot of our existential loneliness. Rosemary, do you agree? Do you think the sort of political social fragmentation actually has an impact on individual feelings of loneliness? Um, it must, because it, 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 it isolates you from what Hugh was talking about, that, that herd that we all want to be part of. So, and... I mean, I speak to it in terms of physical segregation, but people with disability, and to a certain extent myself, even though I, um, I have the opportunity to engage a hell of a lot more than what lots of people with disability do, um, it's, it's that specific segregation that is structurally embedded for people with disability, the way they're segregated in education, the way they're segregated in terms of residential care and services. And it, it's that structural segregation that disconnects them and really does see them as different. And so they don't understand what the community is trying to achieve by making them so isolated. And so it, it, it's a confusing moral compass more than anything. Mm. So, I mean... And, and that was worse during COVID, from, from what I understand you, you, you say, because of, you know, these sort of uh, statements that were made about the way service or healthcare would be prioritised, people effectively being sort of left off the list of, of care. Yeah, look, there was a situation um, that arose... So, and it started in Italy. Italy got itself into... Um, its healthcare system was under incredible stress and this, this is what health pandemics do and this is what, you know, the whole physical distancing was about to try and keep the pressure off the health, healthcare system so the death rates didn't escalate. And so in managing that pressure on the healthcare systems, various countries, um, Italy, Spain, Canada, Britain, all started to develop what they were calling critical care triage systems. And we'd started the pandemic when everyone was going going on and saying, oh, look, you know, it, for the most people, it's just going to be a mild flu. But for anyone with a... It's, it's really only a concern for the pre, people with pre-existing conditions and the elderly. So 
you know, it, 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 you know, most of us will be okay. And that sort of, you know, started the concept that, oh yeah, well, we're just, we're just the collateral damage. But then the critical care stuff started to come out. And I mean, I write about ableism, I, I, I teach human rights, I, I deal with that on an academic level day in, day out. And I was asked to do this statement of concern around the um, critical care triage. And there was examples from various countries where they were just singling out diagnostic groups, not based on any clinical analysis, just diagnostic groups that were being listed that wouldn't receive critical, mm. critical care. How, how do you feel as an individual about that? Well, it was such a visceral reaction that I had. It was so in my face that I was dispensable. My life wasn't valued and I was dispensable. Now, I had this illusion that I was this... I thought I was doing a pretty good job with my life, you know, <laughs> working and, you know, I own my home and I love my family and, you know, I've got friends and thought I was contributing. But when it came down to it, I was dispensable. I was not one of the real people. And, yeah, it hit me in the face. I'm really sorry to hear that. It's yeah. awful. Um, look, I was not alone. I mean, I think you speak to anybody with a disability when that triage stuff was happening. And how do you think older people feel? And, I mean, older people are really only ending up in aged care systems because of their impairments. And so, yeah, from the word go, it's been reinforced to them. They're the collateral damage. All right, let's take our next question tonight. It comes from Stuart Long. Thank you, Hamish. Good evening, panel. I'm single, and in my experience, society perceives us as lonely, but couples aren't because two is company, one is not. I enjoy my own company, is there a misconception that single people are lonely and married people aren't? Gus? Yeah, I definitely think there's that misconception, 100%. I know a lot of people that are, that are single. My mum, for instance, she's not lonely at all. She's got a very good life. She's worked out her own way to get things done. She's got her friends when she wants to see them. She goes to the movies, goes out for a curry. That's what she does. And she loves having her little routines, loves being up at early and then going to bed early, and that's what she does. Um, and there's lots of married people, especially blokes that I speak to, who are extremely lonely and don't feel like they've got any real connection with their partner. So I think that's... That's, you're absolutely onto something there. Hugh, uh, what's your view on this? Can, can, you, can you be in a relationship and still feel lonely? Because the, the, yes. statistics, the statistics show that you are less likely to feel lonely if you are in a relationship. Less likely to, that's right. I mean, we can't generalise about this. We have to look at individual cases, of course. Um, but uh, this, is, this is absolutely right. You can be alone, you can be socially isolated and not feel lonely at all. Uh, in 25% of Australian households, there is just one person living. But as with the point Sarah was making about social media, I mean, it, people will respond to social media in a, a totally different way according to whether they're in touch with people they know, in which case it's an augmentation of, a, of an actual friendship or relationship versus people they don't know. Now, in the same way, when we're talking about people who live alone, there is a huge difference between people who've chosen to live alone, who are voluntary soloists, uh, and who will typically say, I love living alone, it's a symbol of my freedom and independence, I can find people when I need them, I love coming home, shut the door, punch the air and say, alone at last, uh, now I can watch daytime television and eat baked beans out of a can and no one's going to criticise me, versus the people who've been pitchforked into living alone involuntarily because of bereavement or relationship breakdown uh, or because of some circumstance in their lives that caused them to be living alone unwillingly. And those people are much more at risk of, loneliness, of aloneness morphing into loneliness. 
uh, in the years of research okay. uh, uh, when I've talked to people who do live you, alone. I, I, uh, I particularly want to bring Rosemary in on that point because I, I can see you nodding and I, I know that uh, circumstances in your life changed dramatically just before you turned 20. And, and I wonder how loneliness has changed for you as a concept since then? Um, well, I mean, loneliness for me when I was a kid, I grew up on the outskirts of Sydney and it was still, you know, we were in and out of, you know, the neighbour's place across the paddocks, had the dog, you know, had our bikes. I had three brothers, um, all older than me, you know, and a really, really close family, you know, incredibly lucky upbringing, um, you know, and, um, and the same, have friends right through, but, and then all of a sudden I broke my neck and, you know, I, I went into this as an able-bodied person, so I carried with it all those prejudices and stereotypes about people with disability. And so, just after having my accident, it, it was lonely because I didn't want to fulfil those stereotypes that I was a, going to be a burden to everybody. Um, and, of course, you know, the classic is people with disability aren't seen as sexual beings. Um, and I was having a joke with Sarah. She was talking about how long she'd been single. I said, don't even try. I'm going to win <laughs> hands down. I'm going to win hands down. Um, and, yeah, I, like, I'm intimately lonely because I've never been in a long-term adult relationship since my accident. And um, so, yeah, there, there, there is that sense of intimate loneliness rather than um, just being lonely because I get time to myself and I love having time to myself. It's not hard for me to have a lot of time to myself because I can't eat or drink by myself. I need assistance and support for that. And I adore the time that I do get by myself. I actually, you know, quite happy with my own company, but I am intimately lonely. But people with disability don't often get to choose who they live with, you know, especially people that are in group homes. And they actually don't get to choose sometimes, a lot of the time, who works with them. And so the concept of being alone for them is a bit of a luxury type com concept because they haven't had to, they haven't had the chance to be choose. So Michelle Lim, loneliness has a lot of different shapes. That's right. So I think what Rosemary is saying is basically that, you know, there's different elements of her and her social needs are very complex. So for her, you know, intimate loneliness is something that is uh, very real. But, you know, socially, for example, she may be, um, you know, feeling more socially satisfied with friends and family. So I think that differences around how we would feel about different relationships and it really just is a demonstration of how complex our social needs are. Um, and a lot of people, for example, in lockdown would say, look, you know, I'm locked down with my family and my kids and I love them dearly, but I really need my girlfriends to talk to, I really need my friends to hang out with. And it's, again, a different kind of social need. And just because we are with people uh, doesn't mean that we don't feel lonely at some point. OK, let's take our next question tonight. It's from Christopher Zinn in the studio. And, uh, yes, thank you, Hamish. It's the panel. Look, when I was growing up, I had a real fear of loneliness and spent a lot of effort in terms of making friends. Now I've got on a bit. I'm a bit more comfortable with myself, but still realise you've got to put work into friendship to keep loneliness at bay. Um, so I'd ask the panel, how do you find the balance where you have control between the sort of Greta Garbo, I want to be alone, and the realisation that ultimately we are by ourselves? Sarah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a question that I ask myself often, Christopher. Um, I had to ask that question in the writing of a recent book where I tackled loneliness and realised that I am a writer, 
I've worked at home on my own for 12 years. I, it, there's not a more lonely profession. Um, and I then, when I'm not quite lonely enough, fling myself off into the world. I've been nomadic for 10 years. I lived out of one bag around the world, um, going from place to place. And what I realised was that I was actually seeking out my tribe. Um, a lot of the behaviour that would seem to be lonely or alone behaviour and actually isolated me in certain contexts, um, I realised was actually me finding meaningful connections. And my meaningful connections were with various big minds around the world, philosophers and poets and, and that kind of thing. And I've been able to live that kind of life and I'm very fortunate that I've been able to do that. So. Um, it's a reframing of things, actually. I used to think I was lonely and I used to think I was running away. And then I realised that that was me actually seeking out more, more meaningful connections. And I think that's the discussion that misses, is missing from this. Um, there are a lot of um, problems that have been slapped with the loneliness label. And um, I think that some of the nuances that we've all discussed here this evening are not being discussed. And they're the more interesting, juicy aspects of things. Um, that one quarter of the Australian population that are living in single people households, um, you know, aloneness wasn't necessarily a problem until COVID came about for many of us. Um, because of course it actually made living on our own a real problem because we couldn't go and seek out those communities that we seek out when we're living on our own. That to me is my meaningful connection, more meaningful than living with somebody in my own home. Um, so they're the, they're the discussions we need to be having and unfortunately in a fragmented world with fake news and truth decay, it's a None of that here. Have. None of that. You're on the ABC tonight, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Gussie, do you, do you fear loneliness, fear being left alone or do you sort of start to embrace the quiet time, the solitude more? No, I don't want to say you're getting old, but as you, <laughs> as you get, get on a bit. Yeah, I mean, I'm 52 in December and I certainly don't feel alone at all. As you as we said before, yeah. my house is full and I feel it's going to be full. Do you ever crave it? The, the... I, oh, definitely. And I have my moments. I, I have my mates I walk with every morning and just the drive down there, looking forward to chatting to them. And sometimes we walk for minutes without saying a th anything at all. I think that's all of us just, we're in our tribe, we've found ourselves, but then we don't have a lot to say. And then all of a sudden something will, will spike a conversation and stuff. So I know that I like my own company. I don't get a lot of time to myself. So I love it when I get it. But at the end of the day, for me, I, I know that most blokes are out there talking about changing the, the way that we talk to each other. There's way too much banter land in this country. Not enough people actually knowing how to have a conversation of gravity, a conversation that could actually make a difference to you and being able to have the space to have the conversation. So how do you steer that away? I mean, if, if what Sarah is saying is correct, sometimes in those conversations, you've got to steer them away from talking about the footy or <laughs> whatever it is into something more meaningful. How do you do that? Well, when I talk to a lot of Aussie blokes in particular, they say, I don't want to be that guy that drags everyone down. I don't want to be that guy that is not the fun guy. I said, you just got to pick your moment. And it's not like you stand up and you go, right, to all my friends, let's have a deep and meaningful conversation, let's burst into tears. It's about finding one of those guys in your tribe and saying, you're my gotcha for life, mate. You're the guy that I'm going to have that special bond with. And after tonight, can I have a cup of coffee with you tomorrow? Because I've got to tell you that I'm going down a bit of a path that's a bit dark. It's about having that type of conversation and knowing you can have it is going to be the key for blokes. Because at the moment, there's a lot of, a lot of people out there worrying alone. And I think if we worry alone, then that's when we get some really tough times. OK, our next question is from Sue Martin in the studio. Thank you. At 41, our independent son took his life in December 2017. He had numerous neighbours, friends, the various organisation that he was in. It appears that he kept his worries to himself, not really opening up to anyone. Deep loneliness, even though often surrounded by friends. It's all very well to say, are you OK? But the standard Australian male is, yeah, mate, I'm OK. How about you? It just bounces the question right back. My, so my question is to the panel. If concerned about someone and respecting their privacy, how can we raise the, the alarm? Or what can we ask to really help when we're worried about someone. And Sue, thanks for your question. We've got a picture that you provided us with of your son, uh, Paul. Uh, 
one of my favourites. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you sent one of your favourites. <laughs> Are you asking this from your own experience? This, you know, what do you do when you're not getting the answer? Um, how to get that answer? We were unaware of how how dark he had become. We knew that there were, some things were not quite right in his life, but we heard from other friends later. You know, I I, I thought he was acting strangely. I told him he needed to get help, but you can't just do that. You can't grab someone by the collar and drag them off to a psychiatrist or something. Um, how do you open that conversation up? Gus. Yeah. Firstly, just please take our condolences from all of us, no doubt, in the world, and love to give you a big cuddle right now. I, I, I hear that... I, yeah, big <laughs> hug. Um, I hear that a lot from people and so forth. And you said... Um, when you're worrying about their privacy, I think it's a certain time you've got to throw that out now and just say, don't worry about the privacy. You've just got to go for it and have those conversations that are really awkward and really vulnerable. And people that see someone that's going through something like that, they've, they've got to man up and speak up. That's what the Man Up program that I did all those years ago on the ABC was about. We're not manning up and shutting up anymore. We're manning up and we're speaking up. And you need to have those uncomfortable, but vulnerable but this, conversations. I, I, I think the point Sue's making is that it's sometimes very hard because the oh, shutters go down, There's right? no doubt it's hard. It is the most difficult thing on the planet, but we have to do it. We just have to... It's just... I like to talk about mental health as mental fitness now. So just like you're getting yourself physically fit, we have to get ourselves mentally fit and just grind through those moments. It's going to be uncomfortable, you're going to feel sore and you're not quite sure if it's ever going to work, but you just got to keep going and that's, that's sort of the message that, that we're trying to get out there now. In this particular case, I think... And I think we are isolated to a large degree. We have our own communications and friends and so on. Um, but if I'm concerned about somebody else, I don't necessarily know their relatives, their partner, mm. somebody that's really close to them to be able to contact and say, I'm concerned about your wife or whatever, mm. um, to actually do that. We don't know people's near and dear people that we can help to get on side. Rosemary, how do you how do you force people to to have those difficult conversations? Oh, it's the age-old question, isn't it? I mean, um, it's very difficult to you need to respect someone's autonomy. You need to be able to do that, but you need to be able to also feel that those questions will be respected if they're honest questions. And it's again, it's about what Gus was saying, it's the space and the trust that you can create that will open someone, hopefully, to having a real conversation about how they're feeling and what they're doing. And I mean, with Gus, my condolences to you and I, I don't suggest that you didn't, your, your son felt that he didn't have that trust. It's, I, I don't know what is, I honestly don't know what makes it special, but um, it's worth the try to try and get that space, to try and have that honesty. And it's the sincerity that you go into it with that's the important thing. And that comes back to the quality of our relationships and, um, and that space. It's that trusting space that's... I mean, it's not my area of expertise, but, I mean, I have friends in my life that I know create that space for me. And um, that is all so important. OK. Just to... I was just going to say, in terms of what to do if you feel that you don't know a direct connect, I can just speak from experience that it's often been the kindness of strangers that, or friends that are a couple of times removed that have saved me. Um, Why is that? Why is that easier than someone closer? I don't know that it was easier. They were the ones brave enough. Right. Um, and maybe it is easier when you're not intimately connected. Um, but yeah. Absolutely, I have appreciated it and I would say it saved me several times. Um, 
And the one other thing I would say is when you're in that position, sometimes you do need to be told what you need to be asked. Um, and so I wouldn't be afraid of asking the question because quite often um, you're in a space where you can't make those judgments for yourself. So you feel very safe that somebody has made that judgment for you. So. Lots of times you don't want to hurt the, the people that are closest to you. I mean, it's a bit like I was talking about before after my accident. I didn't want to burden my family and you don't want to burden your family with your pain. Mm. And so sometimes I'd say that bit of space is... That's true. M Michelle, do you have Jesus. a view on this, on the, on the right approach? Yeah, look, I, I think it's very difficult posi a position to be in, but I think that this idea of burden and not actually putting that on your loved ones is something that is a common theme in a lot of people who have gone through uh, depression and suicidality. So I think it's about us as a community to actually look out for each other as well. You know, as, as people say, you don't have to know someone very well, but to be able to create those safe spaces, to be able to direct them to people, professionals that could help, those things are very important and for us too. We've got a lot of work to do in terms of building community awareness and, you know, making sure that, you know, someone feels like, you know, we're watching, we're watching out for them and they feel included and they feel like they're not a burden. It's a very, very difficult um, situation and it's often a balancing act of not um, coming across as intrusive but also uh, making someone feel safe uh, and comfortable enough to kind of reach out um, in a way that would help them. Okay. And I, I turn it around a lot of the time and say, well, you know, if, if you want to say something to someone, oh, I'm not quite sure, I don't want to be a burden, what if they said it back to you? What would you do in that situation? Well, of course, we'd drop everything and we'd look after them. Well, exactly. That's exactly what they'll do to you. Just have the emotional muscle to be able to ask someone the difficult question. Get away from banterland at least once or twice so at least someone knows what's truly going on so you're not worrying alone. Or go for a walk with Gus. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> any day. <laughs> so I, I, was going, I was going to add that as well. I think a lot of people want to help. They want to be able to... Yeah to capture that social that opportunity to actually help someone else. So, you know, it's really important for you to give that, that yeah. person the signal for you to actually help. Yes. So. Sue, yeah. thank you so much uh, for your question tonight thank and you. for sharing thank all you. of that. I hope it helps someone. Yeah. Uh, and I should say that if you or anyone you know needs support, there are a range of support services available to you right now. The contacts for Lifeline, the Coronavirus Mental Health Support Line, as well as the Kids Helpline are on your screen right now. Well, our next question tonight is from Leon Fernandez. G'day there. Um, my name is Leon. I'm an artist in Sydney and I live alone and I spend most of my time alone in the art studio. I've had many years' experience of depression and suicidality and I've been hospitalised many times because of that. As COVID approached, I realised I needed to put some strategies in place, otherwise it could have been a train wreck. And very paradoxically, this has been one of the happiest, healthiest <laughs> periods of my life. I ask you, what are the positive lessons from this year and how can we embed them in society from today? Before we go to the panel, what did you do? What did you change? I knew wellbeing was my first priority, full stop. I knew I had to make nests. I had to clean my house and make it a nest. I realised that being in a crowded pub was much more alienating than having a being alone in a studio, having a meaningful time. So meaning was important, and I had to stop drinking. Okay, <laughs> and you're feeling good for it. Yes, great, absolutely. Congratulations. Thanks, <laughs> uh, Hugh. How do we embed all of these changes if they're positive for us in the way we live going forward? Yes, I, I think um, the, the pandemic, of course, has been appalling for people who've contracted the virus and it's been troubling for people whose social isolation has morphed into loneliness. But there certainly are some silver linings and I think we can say that one of... Uh, two, two obvious benefits. One is we've all had a bit more time to introspect, a bit more time to look inside um, and uh, 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 to, to examine... Uh, whether we like 
ourselves to examine whether this is the kind of life we want to be leading. Uh, the very kind of point that you've just made. I mean, artists and writers and so on are peculiarly vulnerable uh, to these dark passages that we've just been hearing about. But, but here's an opportunity for... has been an opportunity around the world for people to get in touch with their inner self, to get in touch with their inner life and say, well, who am I? And do I like the kind of person I'm becoming? And if not, what could I be doing about it? I think that's one uh, byproduct of the pandemic. The other obvious one is that it's reminded us that we are indivisibly interdependent, that we, that we, re we, we all have a sense of ourselves as unique and independent, and that's kind of our outer shell, all to do with the differences between us. But below that, beneath it, deep inside ourselves, we know that we are actually interdependent. We belong to a species whose members are completely hopeless in isolation. We need it. I mean, you think you, 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 you're all alone and then you discover you need a litre of milk and you, you haven't got a cow and so on. So you're, you're dependent on other people to do all sorts of things to make your life possible. And the coronavirus, of course, has told us that it's only interested in the species. It's not only invading Buddhists or women or rich people or anything else, everyone, uh, because we are an indivisible species. And I think one of the most positive things to come out of the pandemic is for us to realise how profoundly we need each other and in particular, I think, at the very local level. I think one of, the, one of the great benefits of this experience for us, like the experience of the Great Depression in the early 1930s, was to remind people of the crucial importance of the local neighbourhood. I mean, we, we wring our hands about the state of the nation and politics and the church and all those things that, that um, Sarah mentioned, but actually the state of the nation starts in our street. This is where we make the connections. This is where we, uh, this is where we remind ourselves that humans need humans and the people we actually live amongst are the most immediate, sure. the but most obvious example of our interconnectedness. But Hugh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you're in, if you're in Melbourne right now, and have been in lockdown for a second time, that, that may not be possible. I mean, Sarah, do you understand this need that so many have had, single people particularly, for a companion, whether an intimate one or, or just a friend that is part of their... Yeah, I think the, yeah. the, the, the situation in Melbourne is problematic because when this first happened, um, we were all in it together. So there was... The whole of Australia was in the same position. Mm, yeah. And so there was a camaraderie and there was an evenness. I think it's particularly hard for people in Melbourne because um, we're not all in it together. They're on their own with it at the moment. Um, but in terms of... So, I mean, we had people that wrote to us with questions this week talking about having only been in the same room as a couple of people since March this yeah. year. Mm. I mean, yeah. it just seems extraordinary that people have been forced to go on that long without any other human contact. It's particularly... I mean, it is extremely hard and I think that that is a, an issue um, that needs to be addressed. Um, we had the mental health recovery strategy and plan being discussed, I think, throughout March and April. Um, and while this was happening, it wasn't a debate that was happening on the street. And for, for those of us who are living on our own going, when's this going to end? When can I touch someone? When can I see my family? And it, it really came to hit home at Easter when the Prime Minister Scott Morrison came out and made this announcement to the nation that we should all just uh, stay at home with our loved ones um, and enjoy Easter with our nearest and dearest. And that left, you know, a large proportion of Australians going, well, thank you very much. Yeah, how did, how did it make you feel? That's when it really got lonely for me, I've got to say. That was the moment when I felt I felt estranged from the nation. I felt left out of the national discussion on all of this. Um, it doesn't come close to, I think, what Rosemary um, discussed with us and alerted to us. But um, it's, it's that lack of inclusion, um, I think, that, that really um, became a problem. Um, and I think we... And this was all happening when the mental health strategy was being developed as triggered by a discussion around loneliness. Um, so it really does show that we don't understand the nuances. We don't understand the deeper debates. I would say that for, for people with disabilities, um, the issue around the caring system 
and the way that we have put elder, the elderly off into homes, that has been exposed. Mm. So coronavirus has revealed all of these things. Mm. We lack the language, we lack the, the nuanced political discourse to get to the heart of these things. I really hope that we learn that language and we learn it fast because these issues have been revealed. It's like the scab has been lifted and we are an open wound and it will stay open and won't heal unless um, some of these issues are discussed more deeply. Uh, Rosemary, in terms of learning the lessons from all of this, the positive takers, I know for you professionally, you're able to attend conferences overseas now, present papers in a way that is much easier than what it was pre-pandemic, are there positives that you hope to retain from this? Ah, oh, look, I think there are heaps of positives that we could achieve mm -hmm. if we had the will. Um, and Leon's point about how important environment is and what Sarah said is so correct. The pandemic has exposed the inequality and the dis discrimination that people experience. And for people with disability, it, it goes back to what I was saying. It's the, the segregation and this, I mean, they talk about people with disability as if they're inherently vulnerable, but they're only vulnerable because of the situation that they're in. And they're in those situations because of the inequality and discrimination that they experience the segregation that they experience, the lack of services. I mean, in mental health, we seem to get the psychiatry, but we don't deal well with promoting peer-to-peer -peer services for people. We don't... We seem to get the psycho, but we don't get the social. And, I mean, that's a bit of a play on the... The, the emergence of the term psychosocial disability now. But we don't... We haven't been able to build a community where people with disability are participating, meaningful members of the community. And that will continue to create that disconnect and that loneliness. And so I think... If there's any positive to the to come from this, it's it's about recognising that inequality and discrimination and trying to address it. And that's the only way that we're going to have equitable, sustainable and resilient communities um, is if everybody is participating in a subjectively meaningful way. Okay. Michelle, do you see anything that we're going to take forward as a society that we've learned or, or changed during this time? Look, I think especially being the Melbourne in here, I think what was really apparent to us here is that the minute social interactions that we would have on a day-to-day basis, um, that was really taken away and, and we really missed those you know, uh, you know, some people would say small talk or meaningless kind of social interactions, but those things actually do mean something within our social routines and they do actually add up. And actually that, you know, being taken away actually has highlighted the importance of the minute social interactions, not just, yeah. you know... The, so the more chit-chat at work Yes. around the canteen yeah. is that what's going to happen. Yes, exactly. And those things serve a purpose, don't they? You know, they actually do something. They build those, you know, the small talk, um, you know, has a function and actually opens up, um, I guess, uh, deeper, me more meaningful conversations. They're almost like a litmus test of, oh, you know, can I actually develop this uh, strong connection with this person? And those little minute social interactions were completely taken away. And the value of those... Uh, you know, definitely for me, I, I really value those little moments now um, since the um, social restrictions have been implemented. So, Gus, Leon's not drinking for the moment. He's put in place a whole range of different behaviours. Uh, one in two Australians report feeling lonelier since COVID-19, according to the research that Michelle's working on currently. <laughs> Do you see clear indicators of, of how we might be different on the other side of this? I mean, you're talking to people all the time that are going through difficulty. Mm. 
Are there positive signs? Are there growth signs? Oh, there's definitely positive signs, no doubt. And congratulations to you, mate. I think that's fantastic what you've done. And that, that level of just looking at yourself and working it out, I wish most blokes could do that, but most of us don't have that ability. So that's brilliant. But, yeah, there's a lot of positives to come out of it. And a lot of people actually who are going through a tough time have been forced, if you like, to actually have those vulnerable conversations and they're now getting the help that they need because people just don't realise what people are going through. Just under the surface, a lot of people in this country are going through real trauma. But for whatever reason, we're told to bottle it up and shove that emotion back down. Don't be the whinger. Don't let people know how you truly feel. It's actually forced a lot of us to have those conversations or we can't hide it as well because we can't get away. So all of a sudden, it's out there and you're much healthier not bottling it up. So that's good. And, and for me, I mean, just being at home with my family was immense and fantastic. I couldn't ever do the Scrabble boards or anything. I realised my son is a bit of a cheat when it comes to board games and so <laughs> forth. So it, I, I worked out a few things amongst my lot. <laughs> Rude out the cheats in your life is <laughs> yeah, great news. Yeah, exactly. All right, that is all we've got time for tonight. A huge thanks to our panel, to Gus Warland, Michelle Lim, Rosemary Kays, Hugh Mackay and Sarah Wilson. Please thank all of them. And thanks to those of you here in the studio and to those of you at home for sharing your stories and your questions as well. Next week, with voting day in the US fast approaching, we look at a possible four more years of President Donald Trump. Get set. Good night.